Hello and welcome to Car Dealer Live. My name is James Batchelor. Today we are talking all things Polestar, the Swedish electric performance car maker. Now the firm has just released its half year results and joining me to speak more about this is its UK CEO, Jonathan Goodman. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, James. Lovely to join you. Lovely to have you on. Always good to have you on. So thank you for taking the time out today to speak to us. Um, now, before we get stuck into this week's news about the half year results, um, you had another a bit of news at the back end of last month, which was uh, Polestar's de decision to list on the NASDAQ, the New York Stock Exchange. Um, do, uh, briefly, I mean, I know a lot of our viewers will be interested in this. So could you just explain the reasoning behind all of that, please? Yeah, I mean, I think that as a as a company, and as a, as a startup company, you we've got some fairly detailed plans of how we get from the company today to a company that's going to sell two hundred ninety thousand cars in, uh, in 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 five years by twenty twenty five. Yeah. Um, the, you then also look at the fact that as a company, we've got three new cars coming over the next three years. So Polestar 3 that we'll unveil later this year, Polestar 4 following year and Polestar 5 the year after that. And all of that requires a certain degree of funding. We've got funding in place. We're, we've got our, our relationship with Volvo who still own 49.5% of, of, of uh, Polestar. And that's one of the reasons that enabled us to expand so quickly and, and to launch ourselves. But like, any child of a brand. So if you if you view us as one of one of Polestar's children, as we started out from Polestar and the, uh, from Volvo, they set us up very much as an independent brand, and that was the challenge we were given. You also need to have a certain in independence in your funding. So part and parcel of that is to say, right, let's take the car, take the car company, list it on the Nasdaq via a SPAC, um, which was the right vehicle for us, and we're with the right partner with Gors Guggenheim, who were very experienced in SPACs and bought in and understood our company very well. And what, <clears throat> what that enabled us to do in simple terms is to get listed on, on, on the NASDAQ, which raised in terms of proceeds $890 million. And that's fundamental to funding the vehicles that are already in development and helping us to accelerate our growth. So that was the reason. And I think it's also a way of, as a company, you want to have a full gambit of, uh, of, of funding opportunities. So yeah, we've got support from Volvo cars. Yes, we've got bank loans and everything else that you need. But at the same time, let's, let's, let's as a more mature company now, also have access to that, to, 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 to that stock market and to the revenues that come from there. So I think it's part of the growing up of Polestar and part of the symbolization that we're, we're now very much an independent car company that's, uh, that's going to be all about growth from here on in. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, it's also just a sign of confidence, isn't it? You're actually going places and you're building, you're developing that momentum. So, um, I mean, you mentioned mature there, and that's probably a good um, moment to actually talk about your half year results. I mean, they are an impressive set of results, aren't they? I mean, the headline figure, of course, is the, the deliveries being up 125%. They're, of course, global figures. They're not UK, obviously. But um, What's your take on them? I mean, was it uh, obviously it's good news, but what's your take on the uh, on the results? Well, I, th I mean, listen, I think they're, they're a great set of results. I think it's been for the whole industry quite a complicated year. Um, we, we're coming out of COVID. COVID's still with us, as we all know. Um, you add into that factor there have been semiconductor questions, um, all sorts of issues which the industry has, to, has had to contend with. So for Polestar to come out of that with uh, 22,000 cars delivered year to date, which is not a million miles away from the 29,000 we delivered in the entirety of last year. Yeah. To be able to do that, despite the, uh, the, 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 the difficulties the whole industry is facing, I think is is hugely, hugely positive and, and makes a statement about the fact that actually Polestar are delivering on their promises that they, they've laid out. Um, and, and I think what excites me more probably is actually that figure underneath, which is 22,000 deliveries, 50,000 orders. And those 50,000 orders is up 350% on the same period last year. And what that means is that not only are we growing at 125% year to date, but that's accelerating. And uh, I think that's something that we see in the UK. Um, 
but from a global perspective, to be up and running in 25 countries, you know, that when you stop and, and look at it, there are not, there are, there are two companies that are EV and global. Uh, one of them you know very well, based from based in California, and the other one is us. There, there is no one else. The other the other EV startups are regional, and we took the decision from day one to be global. We launched in ten countries. We're now up and running in twenty five, and I think that that illustrates the success and the confidence that there is behind the uh, the Polestar brand. Yeah, I mean, one of your other pieces of global news recently was um, well, not recently, but in April. I mean, there was the announcement that you're partnering with Hertz, and they're going to be buying. 65,000 cars over the next five years. I mean, what are the advantages to this? Because, you know, as we know, many manufacturers have pulled out the rental market because they don't want to supply the cars or they, they're prioritising cars towards customers. Um, and also there's, of course, there's the, the hit in residual values by uh, handing cars out to daily rentals. So is this about growing the brand and, and facilitating the brand to more customers? Well, two things. I think you've got the traditional daily rental business where that's absolutely relevant. Um, th th this isn't a traditional buyback deal or anything like that. This is a partnership deal with, with Hertz who are buying the cars. There's no buyback involved. Um, that there is a, it's a very good deal for us. It's a very good deal for Hertz. So uh, I think that some of the past history of what, what there's been involved in daily rental is, is not applicable to this at all. Mm -hmm. What it gives us, and I think that is the best bit about the partnership with a, with a global player like Hertz, is it gives... Hertz are very keen to electrify their rental fleet. Uh, and they've got very bold plans. And that's what made them such a great partner for us uh, with this. What it gives us is visibility and availability for people when they're and we're all, we're all about to do it, people going off this summer probably if we're going to spain or somewhere like that they're probably going to rent a car while they're there um and that gives you a one-week trial of, a, of an electric car now, and i think a lot of people will not have had the opportunity to drive an ev and they can try it in the in a holiday environment so right let's see how i i live with this is this something i should be looking at so I think from, from our perspective, it's visibility of the brand. It's also giving people a real opportunity to try EV, probably for the first time, and realise, wow, these are fantastic cars to drive. I think that could be my next car. So that's very much the perspective we've taken. But please, please don't confuse this with a traditional national daily rental deal that we've seen before. It's anything but. You mentioned visibility there. Um, so from a UK perspective, I mean, I know you've supported Goodwood for the past two years, particularly so this year. I mean, I think you probably had the biggest stand at Goodwood and it was it seemed to be teeming with people whenever I walked past it. So from a UK perspective, how is that brand awareness going? Is there still a lot, lot to be done? Do you think it still is resonating enough in people's minds when they're considering an electric car? Well, I mean, it, when I look at my when I look at the figures and you realise that our, our sales are up seventy five percent year on year, um, that we've got fabulous order take situation in the UK, um, the brand is resonating. Are we where we need to be? Absolutely not. I think that there is a, there is a huge scope for for us to grow the awareness of the brand, and that and that will take time. Um, and as a performance electric brand, where better to be than Goodwood? You know, Goodwood, which is kind of the whole core of Goodwood has been about performance motoring and it's now become one of the great great settings for for for, for UK automotive to, to to show its wares it's a it's a great fit for us as a brand to be there um, I love the fact that you are inundated with people who from all walks of life but who are just passionate about cars and want to understand it whether they're a buyer or a fan it doesn't matter for us it's that ability to interact with the customers, to show them Polestar and, and to build to build the awareness. So that's that's our focus in the UK. Um, you know, we're, we're sitting there now with, if I get my maths right, around 7,600 Polestars on the road in the UK. Um, we're seeing more and more. You see more and more Polestar 2s as you drive around. And let me tell you, that figure is going to grow and grow and grow. Um, but we've still got a job to do with making people understand what Polestar is, who Polestar is, and, and what they are, and that, that will take time. And events like Goodwood are a great opportunity for us to showcase the brand. You know, we were there this year with the Concept Car 02. We were there this year with the Precept. 
and we were there this year with Polestar 2 and, uh, and the Polestar 2 BST 270. So able to see the current brand and able to see the direction that we're going in. And I think it gave people a very clear indicator that uh, this is a brand where there's an awful lot going on. Mm. Now, you're a very experienced communicator. I know part of your job at Polestar is, is communications, obviously. But is, is communicating what Polestar is all about is that a bit of a challenge i mean is it is it an easy brand to actually talk about and get people to actually get behind um, i think i think the the overall message is, is 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 an easy one it just will take time james you know we can't expect to go from being an unknown quantity two and a half three years ago to suddenly being the first choice on everybody's uh, on everybody's shopping list after after two and a half years um, I think that the, the, there are two or three elements that, that are, are key to understanding Polestar. One is the fact that the, 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 the company is about design. The fact that our cars have this avant-garde styling and design that pleases people, um, that sets them as a, 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 as a real alternative in, 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 in the segment that Polestar 2 is, is acting in. The second part of the equation is that we're a direct to consumer company so you know we we set about and you and i talked about it um probably about a year ago uh we set about trying to change the face of automotive retail um why because we believe that we needed to change the experience the customer gets when they walk into a showroom or a space as we uh, as we call them so by being direct to consumer the customer can walk into one of our polestar spaces or onto one of our test drive events, and they know they're not going to be hassled. They're not going to have someone popping an order form under their nose saying, do you want to buy one? Do you want to buy one? We're going to be there listening to the customer and actually delivering them what they want. And if, they're, if, they, if they go to Westfield, where we've got our, our, our London space, and they walk in and they've got 15 minutes because their husband or their wife are next door doing some shopping and they want an overview for 10 minutes about what Polestar is and what the Polestar 2 is, they'll get a 10 minute overview. If on the other hand, they want 45 minutes explaining battery technology, they'll get the battery technology. It's the customer that decides what they want. Now, the reality, and, and you know, I've been in, in, in the motor trade now for God, 36 years. I'm not having a go at car dealers in any way, shape or form. But the reality is that when you talk to customers and when you talk to friends and family, it is still a very intimidating place to go to go to a car dealership. You're driving out of town, probably not where other shops are. And then you feel judged walking in. Well, you're not going to feel judged when you walk into Polestar. You're going to be met by people who are not paid commission. They're paid a salary and their job is to answer the customer's questions. So I think that's another way in which we define the brand uh, in the UK. And it's working very successfully in resonating with customers. And then the third part of it is we've a company that has from day one taken sustainability incredibly seriously. So we're the company that actually gives people access so they can see the life cycle analysis and understand how many tons of CO2 is it taken to bring my car onto the road. We've also the company that's stated publicly that by 2030, we will have a, you know, a CO2 neutral car leaving the factory gate it's a moonshot goal it's a huge amount of work but every bit of work that we're doing with our suppliers internally with r d with our factories and everything else is to bring that co2 level down because what we cannot cannot do is treat the electric car as the answer to everything the electric car still has a co2 footprint and we've got to work and we will at polestar work to bring that co2 footprint down so that the cut and, and all the way along the customer will be able to know with total transparency the progress that we've made and i think that's a hugely important differential for us and i think the fourth part of the equation for us is that we we are unashamedly making cars that are great to drive um and i think that that's part of our dna it's part of the heritage of 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 Polestar is that we make cars that will be fabulous to look at, that people will be proud to be seen in, but then they're also very much designed around the driver and the driver getting the enjoyment out of it as well. And that, that relates to the interface with, uh, with, with the Google Maps and everything else being simple to use. So I think there are 
it's not a difficult story to tell, but it takes time to get that out there and for people to understand it. And the more people understand it, the more pole stars we're going to see on the roads. Yeah. Well, interestingly, I mean, last week I was chatting to the new Peugeot UKMD, you know, of course, one of your successors, but her comments were very interesting about there is this reluctance. She's seen a reluctance of people going into the dealership and it's you, you and I have spoken about this before. I'm just wondering what your take is on the moment with many manufacturers coming out and saying we're going to we're thinking of doing agency sales. We're thinking of taking more control, bringing more control back to the manufacturer. What's your take on that? Do you think that could actually fly here in the UK? It's quite difficult for me to talk about what the other manufacturers are going to do. Um, what I can say is that we we made a, a conscious decision from day one that we wanted to deal direct with the customer. That's not about control. That's about us as a manufacturer wanting to have that interface with, with the customer. But equally, we also chose we weren't going to set up our own spaces in the UK. We wanted to have dealers investing into them and buying into the direction we went. And that means that the dealer has to be see that this is a good profitable opportunity for, for, for them and to feel very much a partnership with the, with the brand. Now, I think that's a lot easier to do when you're starting from a blank sheet. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had fantastic support from our, from our retail partners. Um, and, and, I, and I can't praise them enough for the way in which they've embraced the way we wanted to go. And I think if you speak to any of them, they'll also tell you that they're making very, very good money on, on, on Polestar. Now, it's down to the others to decide if they can make that work for themselves. What I know is that I'm directly involved with customers. So that's good and that's bad. So when things are going well and people are sending lovely comments, that's great. But when things, if anything does go wrong, I hear almost directly because they can find my email address, they send me emails. What that enables me is that no one's filtering it for me. No one's saying, oh, we don't want to, to worry the boss with that. And it's the same for Thomas, uh, Thomas Ingle, our CEO, global CEO. Thomas will get contact from, from customers. And that gives you a, a very good barometer for what's going on. And you get one or two comments that are the same thing and it enables you to look at it very quickly. It hasn't got to go through eight, nine, ten layers of management for, before the people at the top are seeing what's going on. And I, I think that's a big advantage for us and a big reason why we wanted to be um, direct to consumer, plus building that relationship with the people that buy our cars and having that relationship with them through the life of their car, not just sell them the car, come back to them three years later and say, are you ready for a new one? Um, and, and I think that that is one of the things that we've, we've, we've tried to do differently. We've still got progress to make. I'm, 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 we're, we're, we're far from the finished article. But, you know, when I, when I look at where we were two years ago and where we are today, we, we've come on in leaps and bounds. And, and I think that that's seen by the number of cars that are on the road, the over the air updates that we, we've done to, the, to those cars. So we've now run, I think, 10 or 11 over the air updates, which means that people are getting improved range, improved performance, increased facilities available to them on their car. And the days have gone where you bought a car and six months later it was out of date. That doesn't have to be the case at all. Um, and that will continue. And I see that's the way that the industry is going to go increasing. Yeah. Um, you've got, I think it's three pole star spaces, isn't it? L London, Manchester and Solihull. Yeah. With, with the ramp up in the brand and the model range, are you thinking of looking at more are they in the plan? Is that in the pipeline? Yeah, we, we, they, they are in the plans. And so our, our, our plan will be over the next 12 months or so to, uh, to, 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 to more than double that. Um, the next big one, James, is that we will open in, uh, in, in the third quarter. Um, we'll open a real fabulous looking facility in, in, in Batsy, in, uh, in, in Batsy Power Station. Um, and I think that that will be the next big thing, and we'll make sure that you're invited to, 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 to come along and witness that. But yeah, no, we will increase the numbers, and uh, as we get closer to the opening, then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about where they are. But I think that we have a need to increase the, uh, the geographic footprint of, of Polestar in the UK, and we intend to do that over the, over the next months. Mm. Um, I was looking on the Polestar 2 configurator this morning, and you know, if I ordered one now, it, it would arrive in January. Uh, for for you know for, for for balance that's the same as most variants of the tesla model 3 and actually pretty good compared to some electric cars but 
for a brand that needs to gain traction, is that a bit of um, a hindrance, do you think? Or is that just something which customers are prepared to wait for and they know of the global problems and they're just happy to sit there and wait for the car? James, I, I, I'd, I'd love to have more cars that, are, that, that I could deliver quicker. Um, but the reality is that um, we've got a fantastic order bank uh, for the brands, which will be delivered this year. Um, you, you know, and we've been very public about it, the fact that on a, on a global level, we suffered with the COVID lockdown in Shanghai, which meant the suppliers couldn't get goods out to the factory. And the factory basically was idle for a number of weeks. That's now over. We're, we're back up and, and, and building. We're introducing a second shift uh, at the factory to, to ramp the volumes up. Um, but building them and then shipping them means that we've, we, we've lost a portion of, of that volume for this year. We'll still have a very, very good year in the UK. Um, and, and trust me, people are ordering for January, but there's a lot of cars that we'll be delivering for the balance of the year. Um, but yeah, I, I'd like it to be less than that. I mean, I, I think you can look at it two ways. It is what it is, but at the same time, um, it's also a very strong indictment, a very strong proactive um, statement about 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 the order take volumes that we're getting and the support we're getting from the UK public. So uh, I'm I'm happy with it. But yes, if you're asking, would I like some more cars this year? I and probably every other manufacturer in the UK would say yes. We'd like a few more cars. Yeah, but you are effectively building to order, which is which is which is which is great, isn't it, for manufacturers? Yeah, it's great. I mean, I think it, 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 what that means is that you can actually, A, ensure that the customer orders the car that they want and, and, and gets it to, to the exact spec and colour. Um, B, it makes it a lot simpler in terms of the logistics of bringing cars in and, and, and shipping them out. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, th I, think it, I think it is a positive. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't think long term that I, I, I would like to have sort of five or six month waiting list. I'd like it to be quicker than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, lastly, and we've got to talk about Polestar 3, of course, it's coming at the right time, electric SUV, et cetera, et cetera. That's got the potential to do pretty well here in the UK, hasn't it? I mean, you've, you're eyeing that up to be your next sort of bestseller in the next few years. Listen, I think it, it's a hugely important car for us in, in, in the UK. I think the UK, uh, as many other markets, is, is, is very much there's, there's great demand for SUVs. And, and, and let's be clear, this is going to be a fabulous SUV. It's going to put the sport back into sports utility vehicles. Um, and, I, and I think it will be an exciting car for us to launch. We're very confident about the volumes that we'll sell. Um, but it's above all helps to helps us to position the brand because you know as we talked about before we've got kind of the two bookends to the brand launched you've got the polestar 2 starting at around forty thousand, um and then the polestar 1 which is production has now stopped on up, up at one hundred and fifty five thousand. and the cars that will launch will be in between those two and often journalists said or oh, people have said are you, are you planning to launch something that's that's below polestar 2 that that's not on our agenda we're a premium electric performance car company and we will be introducing Polestar 3, Polestar 4 and Polestar 5 in, 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 that, in, in that space that's between, between the two. So this is the next big step for us. Um, it expands our, ran, our range, it expands the um, type of customer that's going to be looking at us. So it's a very important moment and it's also a car that was you know designed from, from, from the wheels up as a Polestar, and I think it gives a very clear direction of the design language of the brand, which people were also able to see with at Goodwood with with Precept and 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 an O2. So uh, yeah, I mean it's very exciting times. Can't wait to uh, to get the vehicle on sale, um, and I think that people are going to love they're going to love it when they get get all the information about it in October. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us, and. Uh, well, best of luck in the future, probably probably speaking in about a year's time, actually, when, once Pulsar 3 is launched and we can have another catch up. So thanks for joining us. Looking forward to it already, James. Thanks very much for your time. That's it for today's Car Dealer Live. Join us again very soon. Bye bye.